Hi everyone, in this video, we're going to learn the REST API definition. Let me remind you of what we discussed in a previous video. We agreed on definitions for an API and for an app, and we created the schema to explain these concepts. If it's new to you, you can check the previous video. If you're already familiar with the schema, I have some controversial news for you. The good news is that the schema is good for an explanation of the public APIs from the end user or business perspective. And the bad news is that schema is way too simplified and misses a lot of important technical aspects. You won't be able to test anything based on it. In this and the next videos, we are going to fix this issue. All of this was related to the APIs in general and a lot of information is still valuable, as the REST API is the API at the end. But these four letters add a lot of complexity. Let's start by checking the definition of the REST API. The most common explanation of the REST API is something like this. A web API that obeys the REST architectural constraints is informally described as RESTful. Typically for API topics, the definition instead of providing answers leads to more questions. And before we start this long or even endless journey, I want to show you a couple of pictures of the REST APIs. Sometimes it's better to see something once than to hear about it a thousand times. For example, the Spotify API is built based on simple REST principles. You can see the HTTP POST request sample here and HTTP response body example in the JSON format. The Jira API is a good example of REST APIs. And again, the request is posed with headers, path parameters and JSON body. The last example I want to show you is Swagger Pet Store. It is a very popular test REST API. And we are going to use it as well for the basic tests. Actually, this is the API mentioned in our story. And again, you can see the HTTP POST request with the body, and the body is again in JSON format. REST APIs can be very different from what you see on the screen. But typically, these kinds of APIs people call REST APIs. And if you need to test something similar to what you have seen, then welcome to this course. And in the next video, we are going to learn what is REST and what REST architectural constraints are. Hi everyone! In this video, we are going to learn what is REST and its architectural constraints. Let's begin. REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It is a software architectural style that was created to guide the design and development of the architecture for the remotely distributed systems, which includes web APIs, on the World Wide Web. Even this definition shows that information is related to the developers more than testers. But we will need to know some basic knowledge. The developers will need to dive much deeper as those will need to build APIs. What is relevant for us testers is to know that REST is a software architectural style for the development of the software products on the Internet. And the key rules of the REST architectural style are REST constraints. And there are six of them. Client-server architecture, statelessness, cacheability, use of a layered system using a uniform interface, and support for code on demand. If the system or API is built according to these principles, it's classified as RESTful. And we need to get familiar with each of them to understand what the REST API is. Let's start with the client-server architecture. The client-server model is a distributed application structure between the providers of a resource of service called servers and service requesters called clients, separating the user interface concerns from the data storage concerns. As usual, the definition is intense. Let's talk about it in a simple way. The providers of a resource or service called servers. This means that there is a server, a powerful computer, which has some data, like as the Google Maps server, 
which stores data, maps, coffee shops, everything. They have the data. And there are other systems on the Internet web which need the data, called clients. And those clients are me and you, the end users. Not we as humans, but the applications like browsers or apps on our phones. Each time when you search for the coffee shop in the Google Maps app, the app sends the question to the request to the server because maps and coffee shops are stored there. That's why clients are server requesters. They need a service. In our case, find the closest coffee shop. And the server finds the answer to your requests and sends the coffee shop location back. Provides a resource or service to the client as in the definition. This is a very light explanation of the theory, but for now we are not going to dive deeper into details of each principle. We'll have a separate video about each of them further in the course. Let's move to the next architecture constraint. Statelessness. A stateless communication in which no session information is retained by the receiver, usually a server. As usual, this definition sounds complex. Let's get back to our schema. Again, we have a client app, let's say browser in the phone. And we have the Google server, which stores the Las Vegas map. Let's imagine the scenario. You, the end user, need a Las Vegas map. So you open the browser and search for Las Vegas. The browser asks the servers for the map. The server reaches in the catalog and finds the map and provides the map to the browser. Then. Let's say it is 2 a.m. in the morning and you realize you have nowhere to stay. You open the browser again and the browser sends the new question to the server. I need a place to sleep. But the server is confused. The server is polite and asks a question. Where are you? The client is confused as well. He thought that server is a friend and tried to push on the server's feelings and asks to recall that they talked yesterday. But the server is not a friend. The server is a REST server. It leads us back to the definition. No session information is retained by the receiver, usually a server. The server forgets everything the second when it sends the answer to the question. It doesn't remember the client or the data they shared. The client has no choice but sends the appropriate question. As it is said in the definition, relevancation data is sent to the receiver by the client in such a way that every packet of information transferred can be understood in isolation, without context information from previous packets in the session. So client specifies the location again. This one server understands because it has all information needed and sent the hotels in Las Vegas to the client. If client will send a request in not RESTful format again, then RESTful server will ignore it, because it forgot the client at the moment server sent the hotels to the client. So, stateless communication is a very simple independent question-answer sequence. The client asks a question, and the server answers it appropriately. The client will ask another question. The server will not remember the previous question-answer scenario and will need to answer the new question independently. I think for now this one is clear. We'll talk about it in deep in the future. Let's move to the next principle. The Cacheability Principle On the World Wide Web, clients can cache responses. Responses must define themselves as either cacheable or non-cacheable to prevent clients from providing stale or inappropriate data in response to further requests. Let's move to the client-server schema to explain this. Everything is usual, clients, server, map resource. The client sends a request to the server. Hi, I just moved to LA and I need a new map. The server finds the map in the database and sends it back to the client. Additionally, the server informs the client that the map is huge and if the client will ask about it each time when a user opens the map, the user will need to wait. And how long to wait depends on the download speed on the client side. This is related to the definition, responses mod themselves as either cacheable or non-cacheable. 
and server inform the client, the client can cache the data and the response is cacheable. This kind of data like site logos, images and maps is the best candidate to be cached and stored on the client side. The clients decide to store the map. And what does it mean for you as the end user? It's that each time when you will open the Google Maps app on your phone, the app will not send any requests to the server. It will take a map from your phone because it will be saved there. That is why some applications take up so much space on your phone. And if you clear the cache, then you can see that everything loads much slower. Because if you deleted the map on your phone, now it needs to download a new map from the server. Anyway, every time when you open the Google map, the LA map is taken not from the Google server, but from your phone, where it is saved. There is one issue with this flow. What is there will be a new coffee shop? Let's say someone opened a new coffee shop 200 meters from your house. The data about the coffee shop exists at the server database. And if the map is taken from the phone, you won't be able to see the new coffee shop because it is not there. The server has a lot of updates every day. Because of it, the client should implement a mechanism once at some period of time to check for the updates. Let's say once per day client will ask the server if there are some updates to the map. And if there are some updates, let's say a new coffee shop is opened. Then the client will download those and update the cache with the newest data. It's up to the client to decide how often he wants to update. So again, cacheability means that if you already asked about some data and saved it on the client side, next time when you open the app, client will show data from the cache instead of asking the server. And it can be thousands of times faster. Just do not forget to update the cache time after time. I think this constraint is clear now. Let's move to the next one. The layered system constraint. A client cannot ordinarily tell whether it is connected directly to the end server or to an intermediary along the way. It is straightforward, but as usual, let's check the schema. And as usual, the client asks for a coffee shop in LA. I know that I could provide a different example than a coffee shop, but I like consistency. And you will see this example a lot of times in the future. My advice is simple, be patient. So our request goes to the server and we have no idea what happens next. In reality, the LA map can be stored in one server and coffee shops, data, names, images, and coordinates can live on a third server. And the server, which we asked for the map with coffee shops on its side can ask those servers for the data. Then, once data is on its side, the server can process it and send back to us the response with the map and coffee shops on it. And the client has no idea about everything that happened on the server side, exactly what is mentioned in the definition. A client cannot ordinarily tell whether it is connected directly to the end server or to an intermediary along the way. We have two more constraints. Let's move on. The next constraint is code on demand. Servers can temporarily extend or customize the functionality of a client by transferring executable code. To be honest, I haven't found example of it in Google API or other public APIs. So for now, we are going to skip the detailed explanation. I will try to find something in the future and will create a separate video. In general, the server sends some code and some logic to the client side. And client executes the script, displays the valid data to the user or sends appropriate data to the server. Anyway, this constraint is optional and self-explained. Server will send some code which brother or app will execute. Let's move to the last constraint. And the last one is a big one, the uniform interface. It simplifies and decouples the architecture, which enables each part to evolve independently. And it has four additional constraints, but we are not going to learn those for now. In simple words, there are client and server, two separate independent unrelated systems. 
and they need a link between them. And because of that, they have a uniform interface. In our case, it is an HTTP web layer with key verbs to work with resources on the server. And we are going to talk about it in details in one of the next videos. Let's summarize what we have learned in this video. First of all, we got familiar with the REST definition. And we learned that REST stands for Representational State Transfer and that it is a software architectural style for web development. And the core of the REST is six architectural constraints. Client-server architecture, statelessness, cacheability, use of a layered system, using a uniform interface, and support for code on demand. All six principles are important. And we will have a separate video for each of them in the future. But to be able to start testing the REST APIs, there are two constraints that are essential to know. The client-server architecture and uniform interface. Because of this, we are going to dive deeper into what stands behind those principles. And we are going to talk about the client-server architecture in the next video. Hi everyone! In this video, we are going to learn what is client-server architecture and how it affects REST API testing. Let's begin. The formal definition sounds like this. The client-server model is a distributed application structure between the providers of a resource or service called servers and service requesters called clients. For us, it's important that there are two independent components, a client and a server. We need to learn roles and characteristics of each of them separately and then learn how the communication happens. Let's start from the server side. And again, I like to start with definitions. A server is a piece of computer hardware or software that provides functionality for other programs or devices called clients. First of all, the server is the computer hardware. Every page and every app on the internet is stored somewhere on a remote server. A remote server is not so mystical after all, it's just a part of a remotely located computer. So, for example, Google Maps server is a machine where maps and images of the entire planet live. Most likely, the entire planet is too much for one machine, but anyway, you got the point. Google has a lot of powerful servers. If compared to your laptop, you have the same machine, but you need to store only thousands of images. Because of that, you have, let's say, 500 gigabytes of disk space in total. It is enough for you. And the server, as we said, stores way more information. Because of it, it can have, let's say, five hard drives within two terabyte each. And it is only one machine. Another difference is that your laptop has only one user and the server can serve millions of users. Because all other characteristics like CPU, cores, amount, or RAM are very different. The server is like a laptop, just more powerful and reliable than standard personal computers. The machine runs 24 hours per day. For now, it is enough about the hardware. Let's check the server software. And again, on the software side, the server is not as different as you think it is. On your laptop, you have an operating system, let's say Windows. It helps you to work on the laptop, show windows, mouse cursor, buttons, input fields, images, everything. And with the UI and controls, you can manipulate data, leave a review of your favorite coffee shop, and unload a story where you drink coffee. You got the point. By the way, if you don't know this icon, shame on you. Just kidding, sorry. The server has the operating system as well. It can be the Windows operating system, but most likely it will be Linux. Anyway, the operating system will do for the server the same as it does for you. Provide it an ability to process, operate and manipulate the data. And run one or more programs, as it is set in the definition. A server is a piece of computer hardware or software that provides functionality, often called services, 
such as sharing data or resources among multiple clients, or performing communication for a client. What kind of services? First of all, it can provide you with a map and show where you are on the map. Find the best route when driving. Find places to eat and things to do around you or when you travel. All those features which you use every day are called services. So there are a lot of cool and interesting programs which we want to use. Even more, all those features are created on purpose so people or other programs can use them. But the problem is that those are on the server hardware and the server can be stored in US California. But you, the end user, can be anywhere else in Europe, South America, Asia, Africa, Australia, even in Ocean. And to use this feature, you will need to use a powerful server computer on your own. You will need to travel to the US and require a visa, it is uncomfortable. Don't worry, humanity solved this problem a while ago. We have the internet and we have client applications. And it is time to talk about the client side. What is the client? The definition says the following. A client is a piece of computer hardware or software that assesses a service made available by server. Sounds similar to the server definition. After all, as we said before, the server is the powerful hardware, but still the same hardware as the client. The difference is that on the client side, it can be a computer, smartphone, watch, or any other physical device. On that hardware should be a specific software which can assess a service. The client can be as simple as the web browser. Or it can be some native app like Google Maps in the Play Market, which you download on your phone. It can be any other program written for the same purpose, like Postman. The purpose of a software should be to assess a service made available by a server. The last part which was missed here is you, an end user because actually you are the one who uses all client apps which assess services made by servers. But mostly when people say the client, they mean the program, like the browser. Let's put it all together to see how communication works. Let's check a simple scenario from the user's perspective. You, as the end user, have a phone with the Google Maps app open. The client is the Google Maps app in this case. As usual, in tutorials created by me, you want coffee. So you need to find a coffee shop nearby. You enter coffee shops into the search field. Once you did that, the client app, Google Maps on your phone, initiated a request to the server. We will talk about technical details in the next video. Let's talk in plain English for now. So the Google Maps app sent a question, a request. I need a coffee shops in this area no further than 500 meters. This user is lazy and won't go further, or something like that. The server receives the request. And as we said, there is a server program. Its main functionality to accept requests from the client, do some magic and send answers, the response with the service data back to clients. In our case, magic is take data, coffee shops, G code and limit 500 meters most likely run a query in the DB and find this data. And then send a response back to the client, Google Maps app. In our case, data in the response is geocodes, coffee shops names and images. When the client, the Google Maps app on your phone receives the data, it processes it and displays icons of the coffee shops on the maps on your screen as there were geocodes of the coffee shops in the response. So that is how the client server model works. There are server with powerful hardware devices with software programs called services. And there are a lot of clients who want to assess the server programs. Each client sends a request to the server and receives the response back. But if you will check the schema carefully again, you can see that there is something missed there. The thing about which this course is, the API itself. Let's put it back there. In the previous video, we discussed that API is part of a server site. And to learn about what part the REST API plays in all of this, we need to learn the next REST principle, the uniform interface.
Hello everyone! Today we are going to learn the basics of the Postman tool. Let's begin. If you open the Postman for the first time, you see something like this. The screen with a lot of buttons, controls, sidebars, dropdowns, etc. It is intense and overwhelming for the newbie. If I told you what each element is responsible for, you wouldn't watch the video to the end. And you would quit the course and the rest API testing. Maybe even would stop to drink coffee for a while. Instead, this video will be short and sweet. We'll talk about requests, responses, and the collection sidebar. And later in the course, we will learn more and more features. For example, in this video, we will skip the params, authorization, and header step. But later in the course, each of this will have a separate video. In this tutorial, we are going to talk only about the basics. So you'll be able to send the request, check the response, and save your data. We'll go with baby steps. Even if the screen is minimized and only the request part is selected, still it is overwhelming. Let's go from the left to the right. But before we do this, it doesn't make sense to learn the request structure in the Postman without the real request data. Because of this, let's start with a story. I believe the real-life scenarios are the best for these tutorials. We have this kind of story. It has the image of the request, the image of the response, and the CURL. Not the best story, but not the worst, believe me. And we are especially interested in the CURL. If you are new to API testing and do not know what it is, don't worry, you don't need to know this for now. You just need to know how to use CURL instead. And right now I will tell you about the feature which a lot of people ignore and struggle a lot with REST API testing. The import feature in the Postman. It is not the easiest feature, so it can look complex for people who are new to API testing. Don't be scared and watch the video till the end. It will be simple, I promise. First of all, let's copy the CURL data. And what is important here is to select everything from the letter C to the last single quote. Copy it and let's go to the Postman. On the Postman screen, you need to find the Import button. It is here and click on it. The Import dialog will be opened, as usual with a lot of tabs. In this dialog, you need to find a click on the Row Text tab. Then you will have the text field where you can paste your CURL. Let's do it. Here we go and now we can click continue. And, and we have got an error. The error doesn't have a lot of details. A general error that something went wrong. And that is why a lot of people don't use this feature. But I did that on purpose. You know, in a lot of tutorials everything looks so easy and then when you try it on your own nothing works. I don't want to share this kind of tutorial. Instead, I want to help to resolve the basic issues which can happen on your way. I didn't copy the CURL properly. I skipped the last quote. Let's do it accurately this time. I skipped all steps till the continue button. Now we have the quote at the end of the CURL. Let's check what happens when you click the continue button now. This time, the request data is successfully imported. We can see the URL, the headers, and the method. Now we can learn the basic controls of the Postman. But before that, I want to show one more feature related to the CURL. Believe me, it will help you a lot in the future. The feature is to generate the CURL by yourself. If you will click here on the Code button. Then, the CURL will be generated on the right sidebar. Because a lot of project developers can share the CURL with you or ask you to share the request you send. And this is one of the easiest ways to do it. That's it. Let's go to the basics now. Here is the cup of coffee for you. Let's have a coffee break for a second. From now on, we will have coffee breaks each time when we finish talking about big topics. Or after stressful situations. Like you wanted to learn the basics of the Postman, but instead you need to Google what is CURL. The second is over. Let's go to the response now. 
Some things which you see on the screen we had partially discussed in previous videos, like request method and URL. Other things are still new for you, like parameters or headers. And I promise one of the next videos will be related to those. But currently our purpose is to learn the basics of the Postman tool. Because of that, let's concentrate on the familiar stuff. The request method and the endpoint. Let's step-by-step step discuss what we have here. First of all, we have the request method drop-down. If we click on it, we can see a lot of request methods available there. There are four, let's say, the main methods. Get, post, put, and delete. These four you will meet much more often than the others. When we imported the CURL, the get method was selected in this drop-down. So we won't change the method and we will leave it as it is. Let's move to the next line. And the next line is the address bar. It is the same as you have seen in the browser, so you can enter the URL here. Similar to the websites, the API have endpoints. The endpoints are the same as the website address, as we discussed in the previous video. You have the domain name and the protocol, and the path is mostly called the endpoint in the API world. So when somebody says the endpoint, they can refer to the entire URL or only to the last part. It depends on the context. Actually, that is all what we need to send the simple request with the postman, the method and the URL. There are much more complex APIs with params, authorization, headers, body, cookies, etc. All of those are important, but to talk about those now will be too comprehensive and intense. We are going to have the separate meaningful videos about each of those in the future. For now, let's send our request. We click on the blue Send button. And we see more buttons, dropdowns and data. It means that requests were sent and processed and we received the response back. Let's check the response in the same manner we checked the request before, step by step. The main thing is the response status code. We have discussed those in the previous video. In our case, it is 200 OK, and it means exactly the same. OK, everything is fine. The response is successful. In reality, developers can return their response even if everything is not OK at all. But we will talk about it later. The second important thing is the response body. It is displayed in this area. These buttons, pretty, role, preview, just change the view of the data we received. As usual, we are going to have a separate video about JSON. And we are going to test a lot of different response bodies. For now, it is enough to know that the response code is displayed here and the response body is displayed here. The same as with the request, there are a lot of other parts of the response, like cookies, headers, response time or size. But again, all of them will be discussed in a separate video. The request and the response pair is the most important part for a tester who is new in REST API testing. Mostly you will send requests, check responses, and that's all. This happens because people are not familiar with a lot of cool features in the Postman, like parameters, tests, runner, templates, scripts, console, etc. And in our course, we're going to get familiar with all of those step by step. For now, let's check the basic one, save your request. Just do not forget about small breaks. Stand up, look in the window and give some rest to your body and mind. And then back to the Postman. If we will check the main screen again, we can see the orange circle on the request. It is the important one. It means that the request is not saved. Sometimes to send even a successful request can take a lot of time and effort. Let's click on the Save button on the right side of the screen to save the request data. And another complex and a big screen is displayed. And you can see that the Save button is disabled. The postman doesn't allow you to save request by itself. You need to create the collection and then save the request to the collection. And Postman has created a default collection for us, new collection. To start it can confuse, but in reality it is a simple rule. The collection is the same as the folder, and the request is the file. To be able to save the file, you need to select in which folder it will live. Instead of selecting the default collection, let's create our own collection. 
Just click on the new collection button. And the new folder is displayed. We need to set a collection name. I will name it Pet Store, as it is in the domain name of the API. Then we need to click on Create button. For some reason, the Postman team decided that we don't need to be informed that a collection is created, so it can be confusing, but in reality it is created and the breadcrumbs showing that we are already inside the Pet Store folder. Now, when we are in the folder, we can say our first request. Just click on the Save button. And again, it can confuse a bit for the first time. You are not informed if the request is saved. And where you can find it? For the new people, all of this can be annoying. But after a couple of days of using the Postman, you'll like it. It has its reasons why it is created this way. First of all, you can see that the orange circle is gone. It means that the request is saved. For example, if I will change anything in a request, let's say change the 1 to 2 in the path, you can see that the orange circle is there again. It means that there are changes in the request. And if you will click on the Save button, this time there won't be any pop-up. The orange circle will be gone. And you can see the tooltip, no new changes to save. It means that the request is saved. But where we can find it? In the left sidebar. And it is the last thing we are going to discuss today, if we will expand the sidebar. The Postman screen will show more information and become even more intense. There are a lot of useful things in the left sidebar. And again, most of them are ignored by a lot of testers. The one which is in use by all of the testers, I believe, is the Collections tab. This is the one which is open now. You can see collections here, folders, and our folder is the Pet Store. And you can see the saved request here. The Collection tab in the left sidebar is the place where you can manage your requests and collections. You can create, view, edit, and delete those here. And again, we will play with it more in the next videos. I think for now you can have the last cup of nice coffee. Today you have learned how to send the request with the postman, where to check the response, and how to save the request in collection. That's one small step for you, one giant leap for the REST API, because the new REST API tester is born today. Hello everyone, welcome to the video. The big truth about the API testing or what the API testing really looks like. In this series of the videos, we are going to learn how to start testing the API endpoint, we'll lock the first API bug, and write the first API test case. Let's begin. Imagine the situation. Today is the first day at a new job. You are an expert, the QA expert. And your day starts with a cup of coffee. Once you finish the coffee, you got the notification about the email. The email is from the manager. The manager thanked us for highlighting the documentation issues we spotted in a previous video and informs us that the issue is fixed and he has improved the documentation. As the usual, motivation video. You click on the story link. You are full of hope to see new documentation, maybe even written in Gherkin. And there you go, the new perfect documentation, one image of the request and one more image of the response. The manager didn't lie to us, the story is better. We have some information in the description. Not exactly what we expected, but still. You click on the first image of the request. We have the image of the swagger not in a good resolution. And as usual, we will have a separate video dedicated to the swagger tool. For now, all you need to know is that swagger is the tool for API documentation. And if you have a link to it, you have power in your hands but not in our case. We have an image of the swagger, and I know what you think, it is stupid to test with this kind of requirements. And I hear you, but we are going to do it anyway. I want to show you that the impossible is possible. The idea is that if we know how to test with bad requirements, then testing with requirements will be a joke for you. So let's test the story with screenshots. 
But before that, we need to leave a comment in the Jura. In the comment, we are grateful for the great documentation and we ask for the Swagger URL instead of the images. We posted the comment. What we are going to do next? We can drink another cup of coffee while we are waiting for the Swagger URL. But there is no guarantee that we will receive the answer soon. Another option is to start testing now with this type of requirement. Let's get back to the request image. Some things are new for you on that screen, like parameters, and I promise one of the next videos will be related to those. Let's concentrate on the familiar stuff for you. And there are two things we have partially learned, the request method and the path. Let's add those to the Postman. As we discussed before, this part of the Postman tools is related to the request. When we test the API endpoint, we start from the request URL and the request method. And we will start with the request method. The request method can be checked here. It is the drop-down where we can select which method we want to use. And the get method is selected as default. Let's check the image of the request in the story one more time. We can see that method that we need to use is the get method, so we don't need to change anything in the postman. The first part is clear, the get method will be used. The second item which we need is the URL. I hope you still remember that, what we discussed in the theoretical video. And as we discussed before, the URL consists of three parts. You have the path, the domain name, and the protocol. And we need all of them to be able to send the request. Let's check what we have on the Swagger image. And so far, we can see only one part of the URL, the last part, the path. And we can't copy it, as it is the image. We have no other way but to type it into the Postman address bar manually. Let's do it. As we said before, this is the address bar, is the same as you have seen in the browser, and we have entered the path here. But this is not enough. There are two missing parts, the domain name and the protocol. Let's check the Swagger image. There are several ways to find the API URL in the Swagger, but in our case, we don't have access to the Swagger. We have just an image. And at first glance, you can't see any domain name, but there is a URL on the screen. And it is in the browser address bar. We are interested in this part, pathstore.swagger.io. This is our base URL. We have no other option but to type it manually into the Postman address bar. Here we go. Now it starts to look like a URL. And the last part, the protocol, it is not mandatory, because if you won't put it, the Postman will send the protocol for you, similar to what the browser does. But let's check the Swagger one more time. The protocol is not displayed in the address bar, but we know that browser sends HTTP by default. Only one question is if it is the HTTP or HTTPS. And we can see a lock icon displayed in the address bar. This means that the protocol is HTTPS. And again, we have no other choice than to type it manually into the Postman. Our URL looks like a valid URL now. The only thing which still is not common is the path ID. What this path ID is, is the path parameter. And as I said, we will have a separate video about those in the future. Let's check the Swagger image. The path parameters are described in this section. There is information about the valid data format and more, and we can see one in the input field. Let's put it into the Postman. Finally, our URL looks like a valid URL, and the get method is selected. That is all that we need to send the basic and simple request to the Postman. Let's click on the blue Send button. And we got the response, but it doesn't look like what we expected. The response code is 404 not found, and the body is the same. We need to compare this to our requirements. But before that, let's drink a cup of coffee. We need a coffee break for a second. If all of this seems complex for you, don't worry. It's always hard to start learning something new, but once you learn it, it won't be so difficult anymore. 
and in the next video we are going to investigate the issue and log our first defect report. Hope to see you there!
Hello everyone, welcome to the video, the ant. So I have a piece of bad news for you. This is the end of the free API testing course for beginners. I think we already learned a lot as for the free course. And there are more bad news. Unfortunately, the paid version of the course is not available yet. Status, work in progress. Most likely you have the question, when is it planned to be released? The planned release date is December 1st, 2022, but I can't promise anything especially considering where I am now. The free version of the course took exactly six months to develop. I hope I will be able to finish the paid version in three months. In the meantime, I wish you good projects, or at least interesting projects, be in peace and safe. Also, do not forget to do the breaks during work time. Care about your body. Sitting for hours is not healthy. I hope to see you all on the 1st of December. So long, young testers. So long.